Lowe and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. Episode 19, Baz McAllister. When we meet at the News Queensland offices in late February, he is only a couple of months into his new job in charge of the Courier Mail's weekly colour magazine, Q Weekend. I had not met the man prior to this interview, but I had observed his Irish charm and wit from a packed auditorium during the 2015 Clarions, the annual Queensland Media Awards that Baz co-hosted and wrote the script for. Thanks to his background as a stand-up comic and snappy newspaper headline writer, his clever, media-centric jokes were a clear hit with the crowd of journalists, and the scene was topped off by the handsome kilt he wore on the night. Our conversation touches on Baz's upbringing in Northern Ireland, and how his early interest in language was earned through reading fantasy and science fiction. How working at a Borders bookshop in the middle of Glasgow changed his reading habits. Why he decided to leave the UK in search of a new life and career in Australia. How he began writing film reviews for the Brisbane Street Press, and later became a national arts editor. How his sub-editing and headline writing skills helped with his stand-up comedy debut, and how he learned to cope with bearing witness to terrible things, such as watching footage of beheadings while working on the back bench of production staff at the Courier Mail. Introducing Baz McAllister, editor of Q Weekend. Nice to be here. It's, uh, it's nice for you to be here. <laughs> yes, in it's deep in the belly of the yeah. beast. As a freelancer, it's a, <laughs> a rare opportunity. <laughs> uh, tell me, it's it's Wednesday morning. Yes. How is how is your weekly production schedule as QEK editor? What's going on at the moment? So we're right in the middle of the production schedule. We um, we go to well, we have a deadline of Friday five pm, um, and because it's a gloss publication. We won't see the finished product for about eight days after that, um, but you know it's always worth the wait. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we kind of begin putting together an issue on the Monday in earnest, and by Wednesday we're usually pretty well established, and we'll have a set of proofs on the editor's desk by tomorrow evening. Mm-hmm. So, how many issues have you done now as editor? You're still only just a few months. Ago. Yeah, this will this will be my sixth that uh-huh. we're working on now. Yeah, so just a just a few weeks in the job. How so are you far. adjusting to it? It's a big adjustment because uh, I've been on the newspaper, I've been working for the Courier Mail for about six years and I began as a downtable sub um, in News Central where we subbed all kinds of copy from all around the group, from uh, community stuff, from Quest, uh, regionals um, and everything from the Courier Mail including news, sport, lifestyle, you know, just whatever we picked up from the queue. But um, that has changed now and we've gone back to having specialised subs in different departments all around the building, which I think works really well because it saves a lot of time if you have someone who knows sport inside out and backwards. They don't need to look anything up. They just know how to do their job. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so I think it's, it's working well. But um, I moved to the backbench of the newspaper about three years after that and about three years ago. What uh, is the backbench? So the backbench is a group of about eight or nine jet fighter pilots, like senior production guys who, who are the people who write all the best headlines, uh, look after the page layouts. Basically, you know, we 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 make the paper look the way it looks. Um, and uh, I, I do miss the atmosphere of that, because it was kind of like a, it felt like a special forces unit, you know, it just felt like a Marine Corps. The morale was really high. We just came in at between one and five and, and finished at between sort of nine and midnight and we got the job done, mm-hmm. you know, so we, we're really pleased with what we're putting out. It's a, a really intelligent, articulate bunch of people who aren't afraid to indulge in a bit of grim humour. So <laughs> you, you and your team are responsible for a lot of the punny headlines that we see each year in the, the Clarion Awards, for example, or further down the track, the, Walk, yeah. the Walkley Awards, sort of like the, the very uh, sharp summaries of issues in you know three to five That's words. Right. Anything that got on Media Watch we weren't responsible for. Mm-hmm. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with those headlines, um, w- were they workshopped amongst the team or were you very protective of your, your headlines? Some of them are. It's, it's, it's a really interesting art headline writing because uh, my mind has always worked in double think. Uh, I, 
wordplay. Whenever I hear a sentence, I'm always thinking of a way to make a joke out of it, even just in conversation. It drives my wife insane. But it actually is, is a big plus for headlines because when you are told the logline of a story, you immediately go, oh yeah, well that word works with that word and that sounds like that movie title or that sounds like that song title or that, you know, so you can kind of twist it into anything that, that you want in a way. Um, and sometimes someone else will hear that you're looking after a page and they'll go, oh, you've got to headline that, <laughs> bang. And you go, well, I could sit here for an hour and I can't do any better than that. So. Mm -hmm fair play to you. Um, is that the kind of thing that can be learned or taught, that art of headline writing? It's, I think it would be very hard. Mm -hmm. um, it would be the same as teaching writing. I, I firmly believe that you've either got it or you don't, really. Uh, you can you can learn formulae, but unless you've got a little spark that leads your mind down those pathways, then maybe it's not going to be the best way to go about it. Hmm. So what do you think is different about your mind that you think in that way that allows you to <laughs> allowed you to do that job so well? Um, I guess I'm a smart arse. <laughs> is, is that the easy way to say it, maybe? That's kind of what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I, as, a, as a kid, uh, and I, I assume a lot of writers have this same story, as a kid, you know, I lost myself in books, uh, wasn't very sporty, wasn't terribly outgoing for a long time as well um, and just read an awful lot and, and that kind of trained your mind to escape and to and to play with words and to think about you know to imagine scenarios and situations um, I read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy as well so we're talking about big ideas that take you well outside the little town where I grew up in right you know? um, so I, I kind of think that my mind went in those directions and, and learned how to talk to itself very early on and it still talks to itself not not in any kind of that sounds pretty bad right <laughs> everyone has an internal monologue. everyone has an internal monologue and, and mine quite often throws up stupid ideas and i'll reject 50 percent of them but 50 percent of them i'll run with <laughs> especially when writing headlines yeah yeah we've written i've we've written things that and, and we've come up with things that we never thought would get over the line um Sean Keeley, my colleague, won a Walkley this year for the headline Jihad Me at Hello, mm -hmm. which was about jihadi brides. Mm -hmm. And it was fantastic. And I think three of us maybe came up with that independently of each other at various times and were banging around. But Sean was the guy who finally sort of got on the page and he got the award from a fair play to him. But that was one I honestly thought would just would, would die at the, at the proofing stage. <laughs> <laughs> but then it won a Walkley. So you've you got to take a little bit of a risk. And it, it, it could have been perceived as slightly racy that headline mm. and I guess it was but uh, but you know it, it speaks for itself now any, it's, other, any other favourites that come to mind from your headline writing days mm. maybe that's stretching your mind a bit too far because you did say before you started that you have a terrible memory yeah I, I do I have a <laughs> terrible memory for headlines and for jokes to be honest you're, um, a, well, you're a stand up <laughs> comic which we'll come to yeah, later on yeah. so alright forget that question <laughs> where did you grow up guys um, well, I grew up in um, Northern Ireland. I was born in the hospital in Ballymoney, uh, which is in North Antrim, a big market town. And then for the first few years of my life, I lived in Bushmills. Uh, you may know the name from the whiskey. Um, Bushmills is a little town on the North Antrim coast of, I guess, about a thousand people. Um, one main street, about a dozen pubs, and the oldest whiskey story in the world. Hmm which got its license in 1608 hmm. and has never ceased operation since then so yeah. it survived things like prohibition which basically killed most of the Irish whiskey market right around the island because the Yanks weren't ordering great quantities of whiskey anymore but uh, Bushmills weathered the storm and it's still there Do you favour that draw? I do actually yeah um, I've gotten more into whiskey as I've grown older uh, back in the day I couldn't really stomach it at all um, Especially the really peaty Scottish stuff, but that's the stuff I go for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's it's something I've got yeah I've got really into to the point where you know I'd almost think about quitting this whole thing and distilling something myself one day. Who knows? If uh -huh. it all goes south, it's the backup plan. But uh, and then we moved when I was about eight years old, just down the road about a mile to Port Ballantrae, which is like the the harbour town of Bushmills. It's pretty much the same town, just the the sea end of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a really pretty spot, and I'd like to go back there almost every year and visit. My oh. parents still live there. Great. Yeah. 
You mentioned that you read a lot, you escaped into books a lot. Was yeah. that a, an encouraged activity by your parents? Were they big readers themselves? Um, yes, I, I think my father more than my mother. Um, Dad was into a lot of crime novels and, uh, yeah, and true crime novels and things like that. Mum liked kind of inspirational stories. Um, and I, I don't think either of them would touch the stuff I read. But um, I was, you know, I was, uh, I started developing shelves and shelves and shelves of books and uh, and they didn't do anything to stop that. I think they, uh, yeah, they knew where I was headed. <laughs> kept, you, kept you quiet while you were Kept me quiet, and yeah. It's Siblings? Uh, one sister. Yeah. Uh -huh. Lindsay. She's four, four and a half years younger than me. And she lives and works in London now as a, um, in an advertising and marketing firm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where did Star Wars fit into this? Because you you read yeah. you wrote a, an excellent piece for I think it was the Korean Mail recently mm -hmm. around the release of the new Star Wars film. Um, tell me how did that fit into your your childhood? Yeah, well, that was my obsession, uh, I, and still is, I think, really. But uh, I remember one of my first memories was as I wrote in that piece was of seeing Star Wars in the cinema, and I must have been around four and a half at the time. Um, yeah, un unbelievable uh, that I can still think back to that and, and remember the remember the cinema. And I'm not sure how much of that is, as you know, memory formed at the time or memory amalgamated from future visits. Mm. But uh, yeah, it was it was a remarkable thing, and I still remember um, getting my first Star Wars figure. Uh, which was C-3PO and I remember the shop it was bought from and I remember it was bought because I was good at the dentist that day um, and, you know so all these little milestones in my life I kind of are very vivid relating to Star Wars and uh, you know I remember where I saw Empire Strikes Back for the first time I remember where I saw Jedi for the first time um, you'd rather forget the prequels probably probably yeah I, I think everybody would yeah. and <laughs> even though I kind of was very complimentary about them at the time yeah, it was probably better just to let them go. But um, this year, you know, The Force Awakens really reawakened that feeling I had of watching them as, as a kid, and, mm. the, and the just the joy and the hope. Mm -hmm. well, what kinds of science fiction authors were you reading as a child, as an adolescent? Hmm. So as a child, I think I veered more towards the fantasy stuff and the big series, like your Dragonlance stuff. Um, you know the the stuff based on role playing games, um, so I read a lot of that. I read almost everything they put out, and I got into Forgotten Realms stuff after that, um, and that led me on really to uh, to people like Terry Brooks, Robert Jordan. You know, again, big long sprawling series like Shinara and Wheel of Time, um, and then eventually I tried to read Tolkien, hmm. and this is weird because I tried to read Tolkien so many times. Um, and read Terry Brooks instead because Terry Brooks was, you know, I can read that, Tolkien's just speaking this weird other language. And then when I was, uh, when I went to uni, um, I started studying Old English hmm. and Middle English and I realised what Tolkien was trying to do, gave Lord of the Rings another crack and read it as Christopher Lee does every year <laughs> since then, you know. Um, it, it was amazing and it was weird because when you look back at Terry Brooks's work now it's so derivative of, of Tolkien and every and every single just the same plot mm. same style of characters just written in a very contemporary American way rather than a, an old English way mm. yeah did you see writing as a career option I guess I dreamed of it but growing up in that environment it's it's a very it, it was a very a time and place where you had to be realistic about what you could achieve and I honestly as a kid didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up I had no clue um, I kind of fell into this university degree because it appealed to me um, I decided to study English with a focus on old middle English Icelandic sagas hmm. you know the, the way that language is structured and also a little bit of um, slightly more recent um, literature like Shakespeare and things like that. So I was studying everything from the Viking sagas to Chaucer to Shakespeare at uni and loved that. But even through those four years, I didn't know what I was going to do with it at the end. No clue. I thought maybe maybe I could be a teacher at 
I just thought about being a writer being so far out of the bounds of possibility. Was that something that was discussed among your colleagues at university? The fact that you're you're doing this course and you love it, but mm. how do you get a job at the end? <laughs> that was weird because I I don't think any of us really. I think everyone was in the same boat, and I know I think back to a few of the people that were studying the same kind of stuff as me, and I'm sure they've ended up on the same strange path. I don't think there was a clear path for anyone from that degree, mm. but you know it was a it was a great class, and I learned an awful lot. Um, not just about the subject, but about life as well, because I, I studied in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. So when I was 18, I moved from the small town to this big city, and it was, yeah, it blew my mind in so many ways. Why Glasgow? Um, they accepted me. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. I, I applied to, I think, three unis, and, and, they, and two of them decided to take me, and I chose Glasgow over Reading, I think it was. It's a big moment, isn't it, moving away from it is. your hometown and your parents to strike out on your own? Yeah. How did you fare at first? That was a big moment for all of us. I still remember them leaving me on the curb, and mum talks about it often, you know, because uh, I, I was a very, I guess, insular kid, even even then. Mm. But I uh, came out of my shell within short order, you know, it only took a year or two to make some really good friends who I still have to this day. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it took a long time to learn how to live in Glasgow too, because it's a it's a lovely city, but kind of complicated. In what way? Um, you need to know where you can and can't walk at night, or ah. you did by then. Right. What what years? This, this was ninety ninety one. I started. Right. Um, so there were you know there was still a lot of there's a lot of urban renewal in Glasgow now. It's flourishing. There's a lot of bars and clubs, and it's it's really nice and safe. Hmm. But back then there were areas that were really depressed and, and downtrodden and uh, you know I had incidents uh, where you know there were some ne'er-do-wells on the streets who were trying to make trouble but uh, you know there was nothing nothing too bad. You handled yeah. yourself? Handled or you talked your way out of it? Talked my way out of it <laughs> <laughs> or just ran like the clavers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah running with your feet, uh, talking with your feet. <laughs> yeah that's right but um, yeah it's it, and there's also the, the sectarianism thing in Glasgow, which, I mean, I grew up in Northern Ireland, right? It's pretty sheltered from the troubles uh, in my part of the world, even though they were going on. But uh, you get to Glasgow and the same thing is there. It's just really out in the open because it's all based around football. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Celtic and Rangers? Exactly, oh. yeah. So, um, sectarianism. So it's, this, oh, wow. yeah, it's the same kind of battle, but it's, it's there every Saturday. Do you know what I mean? In, in front and center. So were you uh, asked or forced to take a side in this? I was asked, but uh, the great thing about Glasgow is you can just say you support Partick Thistle, and everyone just goes, "Oh, I'm sorry, they're not doing very well, are they?" <laughs> <laughs> so I learned that tactic pretty quickly. But that's one of the things you have to learn about Glasgow. It's just best not to take a side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. <laughs> when did journalism enter the picture? Is this something that you mm. thought you'd get? Um, interested in or pursue well, a career in. see. So after my degree in Glasgow, I... What was the name of the degree? Um, well, it was at Glasgow University and I guess it was a major in English language with a minor in English literature, I guess, would be the best way to describe it. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so after that, I got a job in a video shop, like a video and record shop, the Virgin Megastore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was there for a few years and then I moved on to a job in Borders bookshop which and I thought when I got the job in Borders I thought I've made it this is it this is writing this is what I wanted to do mm. and I thought I was going to be in there with a whole bunch of I thought it was going to be like the literary version of Empire Records and we'd be in there just working on stuff together you know and our offers joined down a paragraph and eventually we'd all get a book out together or something oh, so idealistic yeah it didn't quite work out that way <laughs> it was a lot of hard work mm. Um, it was probably one of the fittest of uh, the fittest I've ever been in terms of uh, physical health because it was a forty thousand square foot shop in the middle of Glasgow, uh, over nine floors, hmm. um, with a lift that was wasn't worth a goddamn. So you were just running up and down stairs all day, carrying heavy books, wow. um, unpacking monstrous pallets because of the amount of stuff that we went through. So I was surrounded by books, but eventually frustrated by the fact that I wasn't having anything to do with them. 
and then the they other way. products. Yeah, it was just products, exactly. And that, that's when it became product because I, I rotated through a lot of different departments there. Um, I think where I maybe had my epiphany was when I was doing front of store because really it is just about choosing the nonsense that people want to buy and throwing it up on shelves and making sure there's enough of it there. It's it's really it really shows you what people in the mainstream are into. Mm. And I guess I found that a little bit demoralising when you see all the uh, the Dan Browns flying off the shelves and the stuff that you love so much is just up there hidden. And despite your efforts to push it to the despite front, your efforts to push it face to the front, down, yeah. <laughs> and I know Dan Brown's a cheap target. You know, I shouldn't. I mean, he's done well for himself. Fair play to him. But mm-hmm. yeah, did working at Borders change your reading habits at all? It did. Yeah, um, we had a we had a book loan program, so you could basically take anything home that you wanted to and read it, which is brilliant. So I, I read an awful lot of stuff that I'd never come across before, or I thought I would, and I found some of my favourite authors uh, who are still favourites to this day during that time uh, Chuck Polinick mm. read everything one of my favourites too yeah read everything he put out um, a guy called Michael Marshall who also wrote under the name Michael Marshall Smith um, is one of his first books was called Only Forward which was uh, look I'm not going to say anything about it I think everyone should just go and pick it up because it, it's amazing mm. it's um Fiction. Yeah. It's a fiction. It's a it's a dystopian sci-fi thing about a, a guy who's a um, detective and problem solver in this future version of Britain that's entirely city. Um, so it's there's one island with you know just city in it, but it's uh, split into all these different neighbourhoods, mm. like one that's entirely populated by cats and things like that. But he writes in such a great way, and I think still to this day, he I consider his writing voice the closest to the one that I naturally started to develop when I started writing. That's a strong recommendation. Yeah. I think you might be the first guest to have said, everyone should read this book in particular, <laughs> so thank you. I'll, I'll yeah. definitely include that in the show notes. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Um, uh, he's mostly now writing sort of thriller stuff with a bit of a supernatural slash horror bent about like say, a, a real estate agent who sees someone with his own face walking down the street and he's like, what's going on? You know, or, you know massive conspiracy things. He, he loves that kind of stuff. But the earlier stuff we did under the Smith moniker was more sci-fi oriented. And it was there was one about a clone farm as well. Uh, there's a collection of short stories that, you know, two of which always make me cry no matter how many times I read them. Mm. Yeah, so I, I love that kind of stuff. But no one knows about him, really. Mm. I'll give him a plug. He's going to get... <laughs> millions of sales to this podcast let yeah. me show you that was one of the other things about working at Borders too because quite often we had author events mm. and he came to do one did you have anything to do with that? Uh, no I didn't <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know just hearing him read mm. in his own voice um, was was quite an eye opener as well did you go up and say to him how much he meant to you? no <laughs> Ooh. I didn't I, I tried to avoid doing that because it's if, if you're someone who's supposed to be working at that event I found it a little bit gauche to, to do that I, I don't know um, I'm sure you would have appreciated it yeah. you missed your chance best and there, and there were some some other interesting moments as well like uh, Terry Pratchett uh, came you know uh, a great admirer of his books it was even, even though he's passed recently it's, it was just a nice memory of, of Terry being in there he was one of those ones who there was a massive queue of people to see him and he would just stay to the very end until everyone was satisfied um, David Gemmell the the late, again, the late fantasy writer. Um, Legend is another one of my favourite books of all time. Um, and he wrote that while he was recovering from cancer and he didn't know whether he was going to recover. So mm. it's the whole book is almost a metaphor. This invading army is almost a metaphor for the cancer. Mm. He's got a city with six walls and eventually they get past each wall. You don't know if they're going to get beaten back, but that's what was going on in his own body at the time he was writing. So it was mm. fascinating um, way that that was written. But he came to do an event as well. And I'll never forget hearing him throw up in the toilet before he went on. Mm. And I guess it might have been from nerves. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, that was yeah, remarkable, you know, just to, to think that someone who'd got to that level of fame was still nervous about going to meet the people. Was working at Borders, was it the first time that you were interacting and seeing writers in the flesh? It was, yes. Did yeah. that change how you thought about your, one of your favourite pastimes? Very much did, yeah. Um, just the, the, the strange little things that they would do. Like you get some local authors that pop in 
and say, oh, I'm just passing by, do you want me to sign a few books? You know, and just the, the weird way these people live their lives, you know, who, who does that? Who gets up in the morning and goes, I think I'll go down to the bookshop today and sign a few of my own books. <laughs> but, you know, that's the way that... Uh, the polish are probably encouraging to do that. Probably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had similar instructions <laughs> in my first book. I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed to say. Yeah. Yeah, well, did you try your hand at writing fantasy fiction yourself? I did, yeah. But How far did you get? It wasn't very good. <laughs> how, do you, how do you know? I wouldn't even show it to anyone. It was... <clears throat> I read back on some of that stuff I wrote now in the early days, and it's, it's so bad. <laughs> it, it makes Terry Brooks look like talking. <laughs> <laughs> but, I shouldn't be so down on Terry. It's an incredibly, I'm obviously a non-fiction writer and I have great respect for mm. fiction writers, but especially fantasy and science fiction writers who have to imagine whole worlds and universes in their minds and mm. then transmit it to paper in an intelligent and interesting way. Like, yeah. That is such an immense job. It is. Well, look, I think I channeled that all the while I was working in retail in Glasgow uh, by role-playing games. Um, and I, I don't know how au fait you are with this kind of world Dungeons and Dragons Dungeons and Dragons that kind of thing but there was uh, you know every kind of game imaginable me and, and this group of eight or nine mates we played um, there was a Star Wars role playing game that was popular at the time so we, we played the crap out of that <laughs> um, called Cthulhu which is based on the Lovecraft books um, we, we'd give everything a shot there was Legend of the Five Rings the old ancient Japanese system yeah. you know? so we, we'd play everything and I would quite frequently Games Master which means that you have to make the story up um, you have to kind of come up with scenarios and everybody else would make up their own character and work out how they interact with everyone else's character hmm. and then they would come along on that story that you've created for them. So um, in a way it was a really good exercise as a writer to, to be able to write that story but the problem with that is you're writing a background and you have no idea what any of your characters are actually going to do. Hmm. Um, so that kind of, when I came to write my own fiction I kind of just thought Ah, oh, the characters will do what they, you know, they'll come up with something. I just need to take care of the background. And that, that's actually a stumbling block mm. when you're trying to write your own fantasy world. Mm. Um, it was really odd. I remember something David Gemmell said at the author event at Borders, and he said he tried to write a book centered around his character Waylander, who was this kind of roguish um, wanderer, you know, who would, has his own moral code. Um, and he said he wrote a scene where someone was being hanged from a tree by a bunch of brigands and he kept expecting Waylander to ride out of the forest and, and save this person that was being hanged and Waylander didn't, he just didn't want to he couldn't find a motivation to, to do it so he didn't bother hmm. so I guess Gemmell gave his character ultimate control over what he would or wouldn't do which is a really interesting way to think about that Yeah. my problem was kind of the opposite because I, I just had you know, no <laughs> this, control. That this world there, and then there was yeah, there was no control. It was basically <laughs> the characters were other people. So um, I mean, I I role played solidly two, three, four nights a week sometimes, right. um, with a really good group of friends. We didn't just do that. You know, we went out drinking as well. As you do. We did a lot of fun stuff. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that that formed how I look at story and how I think about story. So I think it's given me a greater sense of of how to build a good story, but characters has always been maybe where I fall down but then as a player I was crafting really good characters but I just couldn't ever be certain what, which, which direction the story was going to take them yeah, right. yeah. do you still play role playing games? I don't know, uh, I never really found anyone after I moved to Australia that was as into them well we'll come to that Yeah. Um, just finishing up on Borders, did you have any other observations about the writers or the guest authors that you saw coming in for events about their characters or the way they um, dressed themselves or the way that they conducted themselves in public towards their fans? Any any observations around? Hmm. Um, you could always count on, on Terry Pratchett with his hat on and his, uh, his loud shirt, you know, and I guess Things like that are, are a brand, aren't they? They're a way of saying to your audience, this is this is who I am, this is what I look like, mm. and this is the kind of stuff you can expect me to write. And I suppose that that's all bound up with, with your image. But I never got the sense with any of them, really, that it was that they were trying to concoct an image for themselves. It was all just 
the wonderful eccentric people that they were and they were just being themselves and then managed to turn that into a career and they managed to turn that into a career which exactly. is commendable in any sense yeah very much so so they can just they can cut about it wearing whatever clothes they want you know it's yeah it's a it was really freeing mm. you know yeah mm-hmm. what compelled the move to Australia uh, well a, a number of things really I kind of uh, uh, got into an ill-advised relationship moved to England for a little while um, uh, and then after a breakup I found myself with no when I had to move out so I actually moved back in with my parents for a little while and uh, in the small town where you grew up in the small town where I grew up and uh, I had some money from the sale of a house that was shared um, and uh, I decided look this is this is make or break time because I had to I had to quit the borders job as well because um, we were workmates ah, I see, I <laughs> and it was see. just painful yeah yeah. Um, I think th- things like that used to affect me a lot more than they do now you know, mm. you know what it's like when you're a bit younger and you just feel everything so much more keenly yes. anyway I wouldn't, probably wouldn't make the same decision again um, but uh, yeah I, I just decided to jack everything and with this money I thought well I'll get myself on track and while I'm doing that I may as well study abroad because I've never really lived abroad um just lived in Ireland and, and Glasgow. So um, again, I applied to a few places and Brisbane took me, University of Queensland took me. So I, I did a postgrad in journalism over a year and a half here, mm-hmm. and that would have been in, I think, 03 or 04. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was that your first uh, first time you crossed paths with journalism, That studying that? Yes, it, it, it was. I mean, the first time I crossed paths with it as a as, uh, the idea of a serious profession, yeah. yeah. I just uh, looked at it as a, a way of earning a living from writing. And uh, yeah, I'd, one that wasn't as nebulous as being an author, because working at Borders taught me that not everyone who wants to be an author can be an author. It's, it's very difficult mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> to get yourself noticed, to, to build, you know, you, not everyone can be Terry Pratchett. Yeah. Uh, there are probably thousands of people who wish they were. But, and, and they'll they'll self publish and they'll try and eke out a living and they'll give away chapters for free on the internet and they'll just never get anywhere with it. So I just thought journalism, you get a job at a newspaper, you're guaranteed a paycheck and you know you're gonna be writing and you'll always be getting better at it. Hmm. How's the course? Really good. Um, really good. There's a lot of theory, um, which I you know, it was all good to know, but there were a couple of classes that were really practical and very very useful and I think it was under people like uh, John Coakley and Bruce Grundy I learned an awful lot Uh, I worked on the Union newspaper as well um, which was a really nice thing to do Um, What kind of stories are they doing there like hard news or kind of colour Yeah well it's funny they're doing the same kind of stuff as we're doing now about you know uh, lockout laws Right, (laughs) and that was twelve years ago, you know. So all all this, everything old is new again. Yeah, Uh, that was a a big topic. I remember the the year I was on that paper. Hmm. But uh, but those guys, um, John and Bruce, they really espoused the theory that if you're going to be a journalist, you should be going out and doing journalism. You should be actively, you know, going out there writing stories, submitting them to as many people as you can, trying to get a run. So while you're studying, you know, go out and be a journalist too. And I took their advice, and that's kind of how the whole crazy path of, of my career began. Because uh, I kind of got into journalism because I wanted to do entertainment stuff, uh, primarily film reviews, because, as, as you know, I've always loved film. Mm. And I th- like to think that, although I'm not... I, I did a couple of years of film and TV study at Glasgow as a, as a really minor, minor, and decided it wasn't for me, uh, because it was getting too technical and, you know, I didn't have any intention to be a filmmaker, but uh, maybe a writer. Mm. So I thought maybe concentrate on the writing. You like watching them, not making them. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, I I was incredibly film literate just through watching so many. Mm. And uh, I thought I could knock out some decent reviews. So uh, I remember I I submitted a few reviews to Matt Connors, who's now the chief of staff of the Sunday Mail, but at the time he was the editor of Time Off, the street press. Yes, here in Brisbane. Long-running Brisbane street press. I think mm-hmm. it went for about 25 years before it changed its name. Um, and, yeah, Matt, I think, had just lost a film reviewer, so he took me on. So what was the first email that you sent to him? How would you have introduced yourself? Um, I think I, I could probably dig it out. I probably still have it. I was trying to keep everything. But okay. um, I think I said I'm... 
from overseas. I'm over here studying journalism. Uh, I'd like to do some film reviews for you. I love your paper. I picked it up. And you know, that was only after about six or seven weeks of being here. But I'd read time off every week. And I thought it was... We didn't really have anything like that back home at the time. Mm. That a free magazine you could just pick up and find out everything that's going on in the city. So it was, it was marvellous. And it was nice to be a part of that. Um, so yeah, I, I just I sent him a review of The Aviator, which I'd seen that week. And I guess he liked it, because he called me in and I left there with a, a job to go and review another film, uh -huh. Enduring Love, the Ian McEwan adaptation. An assignment? Yeah, yeah an first, assignment. First, first assignment. Paid assignment? First it? paid assignment, yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah, they paid pretty well for reviews back then. What was it? What they paid? Yeah, I think it was 50 bucks. Yeah, right. Which, you know, for a film review. Fantastic. Yeah, I don't think anyone pays for reviews anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so that led to one thing led to another, and before long, I was doing three, four, five a week, and and then I got into doing features and doing interviews while well studying well. still. While well studying still, so, so you well and truly followed uh, those men's advice to absolutely do the job while studying. Do the job while studying, wow. and I remember some nights when I was I had assignments due and also had deadlines for time off. I was staying up all night. I remember one night, I literally must have had about five, six thousand words due. And I just got myself a nice cup of coffee about 10 p.m. and went, right, let's do this. Um, I was up to about, well, 6 a.m. maybe, just trying to get through as much of this as I could. Were you and making it, sense it was, towards the end? I think I was, yeah. It would have been about, well, you have to ask Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been about five or six different stories or reviews or something, but I remember I got it all filed. Yeah. Did you feel like a professional? I did that actually. That felt really good. Yeah. Because uh, it was a it was a stinking hot night too, and I didn't have any aircon. I find that hard to deal with as a as a hairy Celt <laughs> in the early days. <laughs> the romance of sitting at a desk all yeah. night and smashing out five thousand words. Yeah, I, all the candle burns. It's still it's still a vivid memory because I remember that 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 is indeed one of the first times I felt like a, a pro, like someone who has a deadline and can't miss it and just has to get on with it. Hmm. I work well to deadlines. Mm -hmm. When left to my own devices, I procrastinate like no one's business. <laughs> Fairly common among writers, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you graduated with that degree? Yeah. Qualification? Um, yeah, I got seven, actually. Wow. Which um, surprised me more than anyone else. Seven is I, the highest possible I grade. Actually, the highest possible grade. I, I actually did fairly badly at Glasgow, and I got a, a lower second class degree at Glasgow, which, mm. you know, was kind of looked down on. So the time must have been right for you. You were yeah. serious about this study and you excelled at it. That's right. And uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a feature on, um, do you remember a film called Murderball about uh, athletes who played rugby in yes. wheelchairs? Yeah. I, I, uh, Mark Zupan, the lead in that film, was visiting Brisbane to talk about the, uh, the film and I got an interview with him and I expanded that out to, it must have been a 2000 word profile on Zupan and the people who do this sport and how he got injured. Um, submitted that to the Independent Monthly, which was the UQ paper at the time, and uh, unbeknownst to me, Bruce Grundy entered that story in uh, the Student Journalist of the Year competition, mm. uh, and I won it. Wow! Um, which, which was administered by the Press Club in Canberra. Wow! Yeah, so I got to go down to the Press Club and uh, accept the award, and that was really exciting. More steps towards professionalism. More steps towards professionalism. Joining yeah. the the colleagues. <clears throat> yeah, so that you know. That, that came all around at the same time as I was told I got a seven and I got this thing. So I, I was on top of the world then. Um, How did your role within <coughs> Time Off expand over the years? Because I started in Rave Magazine, which mm -hmm, was the, yeah, the competitor to, uh, well, like, I yeah. guess, the well, cross-town competitor to Rave. Same. I had a lot of good friends at both Rave and Scene during the, yeah. the time I worked there. It was I found it a very nice collegiate environment to work in. Mm. Some really cool people. So um, you became so I became the assistant editor slash arts editor. Um, looked after the arts and film and theatre. Full time pages. role. Um, full time role. I eventually became a full time role. So I think, I think I picked that up about a year into my studies. So for the last six months of my studies, I was working there, Gee. pretty much full time and and still studying as well. But there wasn't a lot of contact hours in that uh, six months of my course. So it was all it all worked itself out. Mm. You were working with a lot of freelancers and contributors, people who were either sending you pictures or commissioned stories. Mm, how, yeah. how did you handle that? Which is probably not too dissimilar to where it's, you yeah, are it's right not, now. Yeah, just, just probably at a, at a much deeper level now. But uh, back then, it was it was great. You, you get some kid turning up off the street going, I reckon I can write stuff, here's what I can do. 
And I'd think of me doing that just a year before, and I'd go, well, why not? Give them a shot. Mm. And uh, I found a lot of good writers that way, and a, a lot of good mates. Mm. Yeah, and they've gone on to do some so sort of amazing things. What point did you leave time off? Um, let me see now. So I was—I must have been at time off for about seven years or so. Um, it got to a point where time off was bought by the music, which was based in um, Melbourne at the time, and uh, they had magazines. They were buying up magazines in Melbourne, Sydney, and Perth, I think. Um, so they they were behind the drum <coughs> and in press. So that eventually became a network of mags, uh, and I eventually became arts editor for the whole nation, <laughs> based in Brisbane. But I was putting together sections that covered the arts in Sydney and Melbourne and Perth as well, uh, and that was kind of see the pants stuff. But I had good people in every city, so you know, and they knew what they were covering and everything. So that was that made it quite easy. But that job became became massive. Hmm. Um, and I guess eventually Matt Connors had moved on uh, he'd moved up to here to the paper and he kept telling me you know you should, you should give it a crack come up here and uh, eventually it was I guess it was a money thing because there's never much money in street press and while it's enjoyable I guess you can't sort of spend your whole life there can you right. uh, you got to sort of get on and uh, start providing for your wife <laughs> <laughs> who, I, who I met in Queensland um, uh -huh. a couple of years after I came here does she have any connection to the writing journalism field? Um, she she did some work for uh, Time Off back in the day. Were you a commissioning editor? Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Very good. I was, yeah. Um, but, you know, she's she was a really good writer. She's still got her, her own style. Mm. But she's a um, uh, mental health professional now. Uh, she studied for her own um, little dream job after, you know, slumming it for a little while in various other gigs but mm. uh, yeah so she's really happy with what she's doing now well before we move on to here at Guru Mail um, just tell me did you get satisfaction from putting together like a quality product week in week out with time off I did yeah and I felt that most of the time we, we nailed it um, I really worked hard on making sure that we were doing the right kind of editing and we were doing the right kind of layouts and we were getting the right mix of stories so I really took it seriously you know it's, it's just a street press right Everyone goes, it's just a street press, but you got to do a good job on everything that you do. You had pride. Yeah, you got to have a bit of pride. Yeah. Uh, you'd get pitches that you, you would just go, well, that's ridiculous. I honestly don't see a place for that. And you just have to tell people, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's not going to be what, what we want. Mm. Writers or publicists or both? Mostly publicists, but it, you know, the, it was kind of a culture where you'd get pitched something and if it was good you would take it and you'd assign a writer to it you weren't getting an awful lot of pitches from writers because that's just not the way street press really worked at the time yeah yeah it's kind of a maybe not a top down approach yes yeah, that, yeah that's right the way. but um yeah hmm. was it stressful to put in I don't know were, you, were there long hours were there long nights at some points to try and make the copy deadline yeah there, there were I think maybe the long nights came from all the other things you had to do uh, like you would basically street press the lifestyle meant free tickets to whatever you want kind of thing uh, which was great so <laughs> that was a you took full really advantage. busy time in my life yeah. yeah I was out almost every night at something you know but that, yeah. I mean it's part of the job but it's also increasing your uh, literacy around culture and what's what's out there and who's going to these events and that networking I suppose yeah exactly right and I, I'm so grateful for that because even now um, I feel fully across the art scene in Brisbane hmm. uh, even though I don't really work directly related to that much so, so uh, Matt Connors lured you to this building he did yeah he lured me to the building and, and a couple of other people who were working here at the time that I knew one guy from, from my course um, kept badgering me as well come up and in the end, I didn't even really have a job interview. It was basically they need get they, your desk. <laughs> yeah. you are well, they, they needed subs, and yeah. uh, <clears throat> Matt said, "Yeah, he can sub." So they they just got me in to do a few shifts and as a casual. And uh, eventually, it must have been just after a few weeks, I went full time and been part of the furniture since then. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that you started? Uh, so that would have been oh, um, sorry, oh nine, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that a, a welcome change from editing to subbing? Yes, I think it was because um, 
the 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 headline thing started to kick in then, right? So at time off, we we just write any old rubbish. The first nonsense pun <laughs> we can think of, of yeah, yeah. Um, and some of them were ridiculous. Like for the for the world's fastest indie in that movie with uh, uh, Hopkins in it, I think we headlined that curry in a hurry. Which is borderline racist. Yeah. Uh, we should never have done it. But yeah, it's, <laughs> stupid things like that come up right. and you just go with the first thing that comes into your head. Because it's a deadline. Um, yeah. yeah. But you know, uh, coming to a paper, you, you've got to think a bit harder about, <laughs> about the headline. <laughs> a few more layers. Yeah, a few more layers. Yeah. So that, that was good. Um, in the early days, as I said, we were working with copy from all around the group. So you really had to pump it through. Um, but that didn't mean you could do a bad job on it. So you, you had to think quick. You had to write to a space because you don't have the luxury of adjusting it or mm. even squeezing the letter, squeezing the letters. You've got to, you know, be really economical with what you do, uh, but still make the headline grab people. How did the queue work? What was the software that brought in stories from around the group and put it in front of your eyes? Uh, back then, it was CyberPage. Uh, I don't know if it's used outside the group or not, but uh, yeah, it, it basically you, you would log in when you started your shift, you get a big long list of stories and you would just hit the stuff with the deadline that was closest. Uh-huh. Yeah. Could you pick and choose what to sell? Up to a point, maybe. Uh, you, you wouldn't want to be... <laughs> you wouldn't want to be sort of picking things that had a deadline of two hours out if there was a ten minute hour sitting there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you, up to a point you could. We, did you see the writer's bylines as well? Yeah, you did. So, yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's the thing, we were in our own little closed room. So the newsrooms of the past where the cranky old subs would sit in the middle and if someone made a mistake they'd stand up and yell, those were gone because we had a wall between us and the newsroom at that point. Right. Um, so I think you know five years of that bred that culture out of this building. And I, subs would bail each other up. I mean, I, I got lots of talking to's from the Czech subs in the early days and I'm glad I did. But uh, it rarely translated over to the reporters. So this was the backbench that you're yeah. referring to earlier. Well, the, um, the the backbench was in a different room then as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it was it was just really subs and senior subs in in our room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you find that satisfying in the same in a, maybe in a different way to editing the culture pages to time off uh, subbing work quickly and accurately and yeah, writing right. snappy headlines? I did. It's a new thing to take pride in, really. Um, and that's I think that's just got to be central to everything you do as a writer mm. you can't give sloppy work in is there anything that you've observed about writing having fulfilled that role for years of um, just taking a copy subbing it and seeing how particular writers uh, frame stories or how you know straight hard news reporters start with the who what when where why how and the inverted pyramid that kind of thing anything mm. that you've observed in particular um, in this paper Hmm. You do. You see this. You can tell. I mean, within a year, maybe two years. I don't think I needed to read bylines anymore. Mm. Y you just know what the round was, and what the style of writing was, and you go, "Oh, yeah, that's that person's work." Um, and you instinctively then knew what you needed to do to fix that or to make it sing. Did the writers know who subbed their work? Probably not. Really? Because I don't think there would have been a lot of contact then. Yeah. Um, so you, when walking around this building, you wouldn't bump into someone and say, oh, good, good yarn on, on that, and they'd be like, who the hell are you? What, <laughs> when did you read my story? <laughs> <laughs> I think they, they got to know some of the subs quite quickly. Yeah. Right. Um, but, but not all of them. Uh, and back then, because I was a casual for a while, uh, I had the chance to also do some freelancing, you know, paid freelancing for the paper, right. which was good. So I, I started doing a lot of travel stories and uh, some some features as well. You had um, one feature in Q Weekend about stand-up comedy? Yeah, yeah, cool. that's right, yeah. I did have that in. What was um, the angle on that? Uh, it was the worst gigs. That's right. From, from about five or six local performers, yeah. And, I should ask, at what point did comedy, you and comedy, mm. intersect? Well, that would have been during the time off years. Mm. Um, and I think it was probably because I was pitched a story on this thing called Raw Comedy which um, I'm sure as most of the listeners will know is, is a, I think it was run by Triple J, I'm not sure Triple J is involved anymore, but it was basically someone who's an up and coming comic or hasn't even given it a crack yet at all. Um, put your names into this competition, they run it over a series of heats and they pick a winner from each heat and then in the final 
the state final, everyone goes head to head, and then uh, the finalist from that goes through to a national final, which is at Melbourne Comedy Festival in the town hall in front of an audience of fifteen hundred people, and uh, you could be named the next, the next big comedian of of Australia. Yeah. Um, so you know, why wouldn't you want to get get into that? And I'd, I'd sort of interviewed enough comedians for time off to know that I loved what this thing was. Um, I didn't really go to a lot of stand-up back in the UK because uh, there weren't really that many places to go back then. Not in not in Northern Ireland, not in Glasgow. You know, there was the stand in Glasgow, which is still amazing, but uh, I didn't get to go there that often. Yeah. So um, <coughs> when I started working for Time Off, I started you know taking all the comedy interviews myself and. Um, really starting to turn the conversations there towards the craft of it and how how these people's brains worked which I think they appreciated too because normally a comedian when they're getting interviewed will be asked so what makes you funny you know where did you grow up did you have a funny dad you know it's the same old rote questions but when you actually start interviewing them about what they're interested in it, it works better which, which tracks back to your love of language and fascination with how exactly yeah, yeah. so so how, how do they how do they come up with their way of playing on words or their concepts. So um, I eventually thought, well, maybe I could, maybe I've learned enough from this process that I could give this a crack as well. So I put together a five minute set for Raw, put my name in, and in that first year I made the state final, which was good, but I think I was terrible. <laughs> I think it's just everybody else was maybe slightly more terrible. I don't know. <laughs> how, did, how did you develop material? You've not done it before. No, I'd not done it before, but. Um, I kind of I started off talking about the the weirdness of coming from Northern Ireland to here and the cultural differences I observed. So that was like a big cornerstone of my early act. And then I just kind of got into more wordplay, more issues based stuff. And I only really ever developed about an hour of solid material, which you know I'd, I'd only ever do twenty minutes in one shot. But I, yeah, I didn't. I, I have the greatest respect for people who can write a whole hour-long show every year. Louis C.K. being the yeah, obvious example. Louis C.K. could write an hour-long show every week. Probably, you know. <laughs> but in Australia, if you want to do the comedy festivals, um, someone like Damien Power, who's a good friend, um, he's he can he can write a show every year now, and it's going to be different and engaging and re- you know really funny. Someone like maybe Corey White as well, whose last show was incredible. Um, those guys can... I'm in awe of what they can do because they can go to 15 minute spots in a pub and be piss funny and have everyone rolling on the floor but they can also do this really poignant intelligent hour social commentary or so. social commentary at, at a festival you know a theatre situation at a festival mm. and kill there as well mm. yeah and uh, just the how prolific those people are it's it's unbelievable because comedy writing is very hard it's very hard for every one minute you get you've got to throw out 20 because it's just not going to work mm. Had you <coughs> performed on stage until that point? No. And that was another thing I had to kind of get over. Right. Because yeah. what age would you have been when you first got up as a stand-up? About 32-ish. So that's I'm th- 43 now. So. Right. So that's 32 30, years of um, 33. being you know, just a guy in the background or uh, in, the, in the audience applauding. Yeah. Not having everyone focusing on you, not being under the spotlight from a microphone. So That's right. Did that spin your head the first few times? Well, the strange thing was, um, again, I'm going to go back to the role playing thing because that brought me out of my shell in a group, and because you've got to do some wacky things and pretend to be the character and give impassioned speeches, you know, in front of your table of eight mates who are all probably cracking themselves up. Hmm. Uh, and then when I worked for Borders, near the end of that, I became a corporate trainer. So I would go and set up new stores all around the country. Uh, you go to Inverness for six weeks to basically do every, you know, everything from building shelves to stacking the shelves to training the staff. Uh, and it would be long days, 12, 14 hour days of hard work. And you'd have to be there and be upbeat and be you know, in the moment and, and show everyone how things are done. Mm-hmm. So I guess that was kind of a performance as well, in a way. Mm-hmm. And, and one where you had to not worry about what people were thinking about you. So I think those things maybe prime me to, to find it easier going on stage, but it's still a whole different proposition when you're up there, mm. the lights are on you, especially in the Paddle Tavern where the stage is at like eye level 
Yes. So you're so high up and, and the lights are so bright. And those five minutes were really long. Um, I think my first gig, I, I felt really bad. And the second one, I felt on top of the world. And the third one, I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of all right. And that was the one where I got through the state final. Uh -huh. so, uh, <laughs> so I kind of found the balance of it very quickly, you know. At what point did you start allowing friends and family to come along to? Oh, I was the, whenever they wanted. Really. Okay, so you were never the kind of one like, yeah. don't come, give, no. me, give me a year to practice. No, I was never that precious oh, about it. Good. They could come or not. And uh, my wife was a nice cheerleader back in the day. She would get a posse up to come and support me, which mm. was lovely. Yeah. And I, I didn't even really think about people I knew being in the audience. I, I just kind of got up there and talked. Hmm. Yeah. But written jokes as well. Like. Ri yeah, written jokes. And, and that... I kind of had to, uh, I don't know, people like Billy Conley, they probably don't even write set lists anymore. They, they probably just write words, Dot points. four words, yep. and that gets them through an hour. I had to write everything verbatim like a script and, right. and try and get it into my head like an actor learning lines. And mm -hmm. I even wrote segues into the jokes so that I would remember where I was going next. Um, and I remember a couple of times I missed a segue and I was all turned around. And mm. almost panicked mm. but managed to pull it back so I really needed that crutch um, I was doing it maybe a couple of times a week at the height and then I was starting to feel like maybe I could do a bit more off the cuff stuff maybe a bit more crowd work you know and, and I didn't feel as attached to the, the crutch but then when I started uh, when I moved to the back bench of the paper I was really only able to do it once a month and because you're working nights. Yeah, if you're not a match fit for comedy, you might as well forget it. Yeah. It's uh, it's like a muscle that needs constant exercise. Mm. If, if you're getting up there two, three, four times a week, I guess like I, the, the amount of time I was doing role playing, mm. it just comes naturally to you. Mm. Um, but if you're doing it once a month, you have to stress before every gig. It doesn't really make it worth it. It's, right. it you don't have fun doing it. You just you get up there and it's... It's a job, and it's a job. Relief when it's over. Yeah, it's a job that frequently you don't get paid for at all. Right. Maybe you get a free cook. <laughs> Not some free cook, just a free cook. Yeah. <laughs> so, was yeah. there a, a parallel between uh, subbing and headline writing and comedy writing? Or absolutely they distinct. Yeah, absolutely. I think okay. it's the same kind of double think, as I've said before. Mm. You, you know, you, you're trying to. Not every headline's a joke, right? Did but, you try to make every headline? But you try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I did try to make every headline a joke. Um, but uh, there's a, there's a lot of parallels there. It, it's really just taking concept and thinking around it and going, well, what what would be funny or entertaining about the way you use those words? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where does comedy sit in your life today? I still I'm still an avid comedy goer. Um, I'm still really good friends with a lot of comics. Um, and I just enjoy going to as much comedy as I possibly can. The Brisbane Comedy Festival starts this weekend, and that's one of the best times of the year for me because uh, I, I try and go to a couple of shows a night um, if I can. And then for the last five years or six years, my wife and I have been going down to Melbourne for a week or ten days to catch as much of the Melbourne Comedy Festival, and we, we just go hard. We go down there and we try and get to five, six shows a night because mm. you can in Melbourne. Mm. Stuff starts kicking off around five and doesn't finish till midnight. So you you know, you can hit a lot of shows if you if you do it right and that's the way we love to do it. So I, I just love the, the feel of a comedy festival too. It, just the feel of a lot of people getting together to celebrate this love of wit and, and love of whimsy and, and love of fear and it's it's everything, you know, you can see a really stupid improv show or a really well-crafted, emotionally poignant theatre show. And it's, you, know, you can see them within five minutes of each other in the same venue. Mm. You know, it's, yeah, it's brilliant. It's a great art form. And I think it's not given the gravitas quite often that it deserves. The only time I've seen you on stage was last year at the, yeah. the Clarions, yes. the, the Queensland Media Awards, which you co-hosted with Catherine Feeney. Yes. How did, how did you write that? Just tell the listeners a bit about that job and how you yeah. approached it. Well, I think um, Michelle Ray, who's the head of the MEAA in Queensland. Uh, yeah, Arts Union. Yeah, the Arts Union. So she uh, she realised I did stand-up and uh, she got me to do that. 
She got me to write the clarion scripts for the last three years, mm. two of which I've presented. Mm. Um, and it's uh, it's it's an interesting proposition because I guess like the Oscars or any of those award shows, you're trying to write satirical comedy about people who are going to be in the room and may not always love what you're going to say about them. But you kind of have to hope they'll have a sense of humour about it because you know journalists can take each other a bit too seriously quite often <laughs> and there's a lot of raging egos in the room and everything but that, you know, that's fine it's part and parcel of the job but you just you like to hope that they'll get that it's just a bit of fun uh, and quite often they do but sometimes they don't and I've, I've felt I've felt that a little bit over the last three years doing the clarion scripts but um, you kind of have to it's it's hard to write jokes around big news events that are often quite tragic and sad that, that can that can fly on a night like that when everyone's supposed to be having fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Were you keeping like a, a journal or a log throughout the year of events and writing jokes as you go to try to fit it all into a week or how did you, how did you well, actually well, write the script? I do actually uh, kind of compile because uh, on the uh, as, as I said, when I was working on the backbench, there was a lot of gallows humour mm. to get us through the night. We we'd often have to bear witness to a lot of dark things happening all around the world. We would get to see uncensored and unedited versions of things that we you know we had to put out in a very diluted form because it's uh, otherwise it's just too horrible for people to see. Mm. Um, so the way you get through that is to make jokes, and there's no harm or malice men in it, it's really just a, a way of coping um, and it's kept within the group and it's very cathartic and I really think that that's, uh, that's kept me sane over the last few years, you know, um, doing that job. So I kind of thought some of those jokes are too good to waste, jot a few of them down and mm -hmm. maybe they'll come up with the clarions. Mm -hmm. yeah. That gallows humour you mentioned, is that almost like a, a defence mechanism against uh, keeping those images embedded in your mind, things like beheadings and yes. explosions and hor That's horrible absolutely violence. Right. Absolutely right. It's, uh, there, there are some. I remember times in the last few years where we just had these rolling news events, sieges, uh, knifings, explosions, plane crashes, you know, and they just come relentlessly one after the other. You, you just you covered two weeks of. Um, every day there's three spreads about a disappearing plane and they we're talking to people who lost you know people on board and it, it's it just it's all so horrible and so tragic and then you just move straight from that into ISIS blowing something up um, or cutting people's heads off and uh, you, you know there's no rest there's no respite mm. there's no holiday it's it's just you it's the new normal Mm. So it can it can wear you down a little bit, but uh, we formed a really good support network between each other. Were there times where you had to put your hand up and say, "I need to walk away. I need a break from this"? No, no. Uh, I didn't feel I could. It's um, again being part of a tight knit team. You feel you can't let people down. Were uh, they all blokes by chance? No, no, they okay. weren't all blokes. Uh, there were um, probably majority were blokes. Uh, there, there were a couple of women who give as good as they get. Mm. Yeah, and the, and the wider backbench includes um, designers and subs as well, some of which were, you know, were female too. So, At the Clarions, you wore a kilt. Yes. You're Irish. Yeah. What's that all about? Um, well, I'm from North Antrim, and uh, the history of, of my family there uh, is that we were Scots. Well, you know, I'll, there's a lot of debate about this and crossover. People say that all Scots are Irish, you know, or all Irish are Scots okay. anyway, depending on the way you look at it. But uh, I've done a lot of research into my family history for a writing project that I'm working on right now. Hmm. And we McAllisters arrived from, uh, well the first McAllister was a grandson of the first MacDonald, who was a son of Somerled, who was Lord of the Isles, who lived around the 1200s and uh, was half Viking, half Scot, and really did a lot to stop the Viking invasions in Scotland up the west coast um, so that you know I can the fact that I can work out who the first person in my family is is just mind blowing mm. you know because I try and think of a Smith or a Jones mm. doing that and they've got no clue it's mm. you know it's a occupational surname isn't it so yeah, yeah but uh, but I can 
I can work out who my blood relatives are from history, and that's that's amazing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I'm sure you can too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My dad has pursued that very project. Himself. Yeah. So um, I found out that uh, the McAllisters came over as gala glasses to Northern Ireland. So gala glass means foreign gale. Um, it's really a, a word for a Scot who used quite often Viking gear and battle tactics and ships, um, modelled after the the Norse um, to to fight in small units and they would be anchored around large men in lots of armour with big axes supported by quick fast moving archers and spear throwers and uh, little boys quite often who would hold their weapons for them mm. and come behind them. So um, it's, a, it's a really unique form of, of, of combat and uh, mm. the first McAllisters in Northern Ireland came over to fight for some of the Irish lords and then the Scots McDonald's came over to gain a foothold in Northern Ireland and they started to fight for them. Um, and we had our own castle, which was given to us by the McDonald's. It's just a little place, there's not much of it left now, but it's one of the most amazing places to visit. Hmm. Um, just this little uh, tumble down tower on a limestone headland reaching out into the sea. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's uh, so that that's where the Scottish heritage comes from, I think. And, okay. uh, that's why you friendly wear a kilt yeah, at least right. one night per year. Yeah, so I've identified, uh, a, there's not a lot known about this guy, but there's a guy called uh, Owen McAllister, who was um, the clan chief at that time. Um, it, it's, as I say, there's not a lot known about him, but he lived in a really fascinating time, and there's a lot going on in that time that he could have been a part of. So the project I'm working on now is based around him. Can you tell me more? Is it a book project? Um, TV series. Okay, wow. Yeah. Um, I've really been fascinated by what, um, what's what been done by Michael Hurst in Vikings for History Channel. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that show, but it kind of ba- bases itself around those really old Viking sagas and brings them to life. So the first series of it was really remarkable in, the, in that it did... Uh, right, we're going to do an episode on what a Viking funeral would, would have looked like. And we're going to do an episode on how Vikings navigated. And they would do some really detailed explorations of how that would do within a narrative framework. Mm. So they'd have compelling characters doing these things, but the whole episode would basically be showing you documentary style almost how mm. Vikings did these things. And then in season two, they moved into a much more narrative structure. and They brought in a bit of supernatural and things like that. So it's, it's a really compelling series and I love watching it. But this would be conceived in something of a similar vein. Uh-huh. Yeah. So that's bubbling away in the background? It's bubbling away in the background. Almost a, almost a natural sort of successor to that kind of thing when it runs its course. I can almost see a link between your uh, fantasy fiction attempts, but now you're, yes. you're basing this on <laughs> actual events. No, it's, yeah, based on actual events. And the weird thing is the story is all there. Um, and the characters are kind of all there. You know, you go back into history and you get the sense of who some of these people were that were shaping the events. Uh, you get different accounts from different books of what they may have looked like or what they may have talked like or what kind of people they were. Mm. But there's so much that's still unknown. And this is just 1540. You know, it's just before the time of Shakespeare. So that there's not much that's fact. It's all, you know, they, they, can, they can date one battle to within maybe 30 years of when it actually was, but no one knows exactly when it was. So you can mm. take a lot of license with these stories and uh-huh. um, prune them to be what you want them to be and put original characters into the centre of them, as I guess Vikings did. Mm. But they know even less about what went on back then because that was a thousand years ago. Mm. Yeah, So it's, um, it's a fascinating idea and one I'm really hoping to get some interest in going forward. You're working on that yourself? Working on that, uh, mostly myself, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Watch this space. Watch this space. Just, uh, just on writing for the clarions with any jokes that <laughs> didn't make it into the final cut or which were crossed out by the yeah, producers. Yeah, lo- lots and I'm not <laughs> going to tell you about any. All right. Well, um, well, well I, I, wrote, I wrote the three scripts and the two that I performed, most of what I wrote survived. The one in the middle uh, was cut pretty, pretty severe. It wasn't really what I wrote at all, to be honest. A lot of it didn't survive. All right. Well, you can tell the, me after the, the microphone. I will, yeah. But uh, the presenters that year, I think, were working for the national broadcaster and maybe didn't feel that they could go as hard. And, you know, that's fine. Mm. Yeah, I understand it completely. All right, just finishing up. Uh, your QE can editor now. 
Mm-hmm. You're the fourth editor in 10 years, 11, yes. 11 years. Yeah, that's right. right. How are you approaching this job and the pedigree that the magazine has, uh, the reputation has built around itself? Mm-hmm. Well, we have a new Courier Mail editor, as you know, Lachlan Haywood, uh, who comes from the towns of Abilene. And Lachlan's vision for Key Weekend is to make it much more of a news feature magazine than it's maybe become. Um, he wants to put things in the magazine that can set the agenda for the state, that can lead the front page of the Saturday paper. So it's my task to go after those stories and find those stories. And um, Again, with print journalism now, I think the way it's going to survive longer is if it goes inside the stories and behind the stories and through the stories and, and provides comment and analysis and detail and case studies that you can't get from a breaking news um, environment. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's what I want to do with Key Weekend. It's got to be, you know, we read a story in, in the Courier Mail during the week that tells you what's going on. We'll tell you why it's going on, who's involved, what's driving them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've got a great team of writers under you. Great team of writers, most of whom you, you know from the previous <laughs> episodes of this podcast. Sorry, previous guests, <laughs> uh, Matthew Condon and Susan Johnson. Perhaps yeah. we'll get a few others on this year. Yeah, well, uh, part, again, part of Lachlan's mandate is to broaden the... Uh, um, key weekend stable to the rest of the newsroom so some of the, the amazing beautiful writers that we've got in the newsroom um, have already started doing some things for me and coming up with ideas mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's really exciting alright anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you'd like to throw in here at the end how much do I charge for my t- no <laughs> <laughs> um, no I think that cover that covers an awful lot of stuff and I've remembered a lot of things about my, my own career path that I'd maybe forgotten. Oh, well, so it's been edifying for me too. Great to hear about it. Thanks yeah. for talking to me. That's no problem. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to Penmanship, and thank you to my guest Baz McAllister. You can find show notes to this episode and all previous episodes at penmanshippodcast.com. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at penmanshipau or search for it on Facebook. If you like the show, I encourage you to review it on iTunes and share it with people in your life who love talking about and reading great Australian writing. If you'd like to email me, you can do so via andrew at penmanshippodcast.com. That's all for now. Till next time.